Hi everyone! We're very excited to bring you a whole new season of Fate and Fabled. Hang tight till the end of this episode where we'll be revealing a fun surprise for the upcoming season. Stay tuned! Gather round, ye nerds and weirdos, to hear this epic tale of a godly war where each side goes, I think we just might fail. In Old Norse lore, a witch was burned not once nor twice, but thrice. On her behalf, the war tide turned, and each side paid the price. Two years of war before a fragile peace could be agreed, till one side's anger was unleashed, misunderstood indeed. But wisdom won, did Odin roar, hey spit in this cup here, and thus ended the vicious war between the Asir and the Vanir. How do you end a war between gods? With spit, of course. In Norse mythology, two competing groups of gods called the Asir and the Vanir fought a devastating war until they combined their saliva to cement a remarkably unique truce. Divine wars aren't rare. They can be found in most mythologies from around the world. The Greek Olympians fought and defeated the Titans. The Hindu Devas were able to banish the demonic Asuras to something that resembled hell, and Christian angels cast the rebellious demons down into actual hell. These conflicts usually end with good triumphing over evil, a reminder to us mortals of what happens when you stray from the righteous path. But the war between the Asir and Vanir is different because it doesn't impose a moral hierarchy. Instead, the two groups combined into a single united pantheon. Maybe the Norse just liked some different story tropes, but some scholars think this myth can provide insight into the actual history of Scandinavia. How about we tell you the story and then you can decide for yourself what it means? To understand the Asir and Vanir, let's take a closer look at how Norse mythology is structured. The universe, according to Norse mythology, is split up into nine different worlds resting in the roots and branches of the great tree Yggdrasil. Each world is inhabited by a different race, like the giants on Jotunheim, and the dwarves on Svartalheim, and the wee blue folk of Smurfheim. Okay, I made that last one up. But we humans lived on Midgard and worshipped two other races as gods, the Vanir of Vanaheim and the Asir of Asgard. The Vanir used their powerful magic to help humans prosper in agriculture, wealth, and fertility. They were wise, thoughtful, and wielded a coveted magic called Seder, which could foresee and shape the future. The Asir, on the other hand, were more interested in violence and war than their magical counterparts. For them, brute strength, bravery, and loyalty were valued above most other traits. Fail nerd, what you doing? I'm gardening, meathead. I'm a veneer. I inspire the humans on Midgard to grow crops and gain more wealth. Well, I am an Asir, and I incite the humans towards violence and war. Weird flex. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get more respect for what I do. You would think that, wouldn't you? Most sources say the war started as retaliation for an Asir act of cowardly violence. One section from the Poetic Edda tells us about Golveig, a witch goddess who traveled to Asgard and shared her magic with the Asir. She gave the Asir gifts, granted their wishes, and brought prosperity to the Allfather Odin's Hall, for which the Asir were totally grateful. I'm just kidding. These are the gods of violence and war we're talking about. They feared that Golveig's generosity was making them soft and complacent, or gold trunk, which is one translation of her name. So they decided to kill her, first with spears, and when that didn't work, they burned her at the stake three times, and three times she was reborn from the ashes thanks to her magic. They renamed her Hyder, meaning bright one. The texts don't specify where this powerful woman came from or what she wanted. One possible theory is that Golveig was the veneer goddess Freya in disguise. This is just one moment in the story where it splits into multiple versions, just like Marvel's many multiverses. Obviously, the veneer couldn't let this treatment of one of their own go unpunished, so they uncharacteristically readied for war. But the Asir were always prepared for battle, so when Odin learned about the veneer's plans, he was able to strike first. The two groups met on the plane of war, the same field where the final battle in Ragnarok was predestined to take place, and Odin threw the first spear into enemy lines. The Eddas and other remaining records of Norse lore don't provide many details about the war, but imply that it was devastating for both sides. After the first battle, the Vanir used their magic to decimate the protective walls that encircled Asgard. And later, when the gods hire a giant to rebuild the wall, Loki will shapeshift into a lady horse and distract the giant's stallion so he can't finish the job on time and won't have to be paid Freya's hand in marriage. Known as the Bugs Bunny Gambit, it seems like a risky way to get out of paying a bill. In return, the Asir absolutely wrecked the Vanir homestead with the battle prowess that inspired centuries of Viking raids. 
War waged for years, with magic and physical strength taking turns on the upper hand, potions bested axes, swords sliced through spells. Eventually, the two sides realized they were at an impasse and met to call a ceasefire. Well, that was fun, was it? Yeah, I mean, maybe we should join forces. With my bravery and strength and your magic, we could be like the best pantheon ever. Like, the Justice League meets- The Avengers? I was gonna say Care Bears. Oh yeah, that's fair. In the long-standing Germanic and Scandinavian tradition, each side cemented the truce by sending some of their own to live with their former foes. The Vanir sent Freya, her brother Freyr, and their father Niord to live among the Asir, while Heiner and Mimer were sent to live on Vanaheim. The three Vanir settled well into life on Asgard, but Heiner and Mimer weren't so fortunate. At first, the Vanir were so enchanted by Heiner's good looks and wisdom that they made him their leader. But when they found out that Heiner was just a dope who was getting his advice from Mimer, they were so mad that they cut off Mimer's head and sent it to Daddy Odin. Odin used the satyr magic that Vanir taught him to keep Mimer's head alive, and thankfully avoided another all-out war. The decapitation was written off as nothing more than a misunderstanding. I mean, who among us hasn't gotten confused and lopped off a former enemy's head? The Asir and Vanir gathered once more and debated, according to the Vol Uspa poem, whether the gods should tribute give or to all alike should worship belong. The Vanir wanted either compensation for the way Golveg had been treated or equal worship by the humans. No more of this also featuring Vol. The Asir agreed to share their divine status, and the two groups secured their peace by spitting into a cauldron. From the spit emerged the god Kavasir, the wisest of all beings, whose blood became the legendary mead of poetry. We don't know why spit was used to seal such a momentous decision, but I love that the practice lives on in the modern spit shake. To the Asir and Vanir! Oh, wait, why not to the Vanir and Asir? It's alphabetical. Oh. So why is the ending to this war so unique? It's possible this story and its spitty conclusion were merely adopted and adapted from Proto-Indo-European cultures as they intermingled. But I'm personally not convinced. The story's ending is too unlike other myths from the region. Instead, I agree with historians like Dr. John Lindau that this myth acts as a blurred reflection of real-world events. We've talked about this phenomenon on the show before. An influential person or local hero might be exaggerated into a god, like the Yoruba king Shango, who was deified as an Orisha. Or a clash of cultures could be remembered as a legendary war, much like the six invasions described in the Irish mythological cycle. Here, the hypothesis is that Germanic tribes migrated north about 3,000 years ago, encountered indigenous Scandinavians with their own differing pantheon, and incorporated it into their own. We know that ancient Germanic tribes worshipped a war god named Woden, and Roman records tell us that they were skilled fighters, so it's easy to imagine them following the war-hungry Assyr gods, but not the satyr-wielding veneer. It seems much more likely that the veneer were worshipped by indigenous Scandinavians who placed more of a societal emphasis on connecting to the land. The Sami people, native to what is now northern Scandinavia, had a shamanic religion before they were Christianized in the 16th century, and their shamanic practices might have been mythologized as satyr. Their relationship with the land could have yielded a pantheon of veneer-like agriculture and fertility deities. I say might and could because unfortunately little is known about this region's history due to a lack of written records and a climate that tends to destroy archaeological artifacts. Regardless of the myth's origin, the war between the Asir and Vanir is a powerful reminder that conflicts rooted in anger and fear can still be resolved through wisdom and mercy. In that spirit, we've cooked up a fun treat for you in this season of Fate and Fabled. Dr. McTee and I have each picked five of our favorite figures from mythology. It's kind of like a fantasy football draft, but without all the toxic competition. We'll reveal one of our choices in each thematically appropriate episode, and at the end of the season, we'll unite our pantheons just like the Norths did. So to start us off, Dr. McTee, who's your first pick? Oh, I'm so excited for you to hear this. I am choosing Idun. Do you know Idun? No. Idun is uh, an Asir. She's a goddess of fertility and spring and rejuvenation, but she is in charge of planting the golden apples that the Asir use to stay immortal and beautiful. That sounds like something I want, so I definitely approve of this pick. Thank you. <laughs> I do like the option of living forever, so I wanted to give uh, the people in our little utopia that option. And the more gold, the better in my book. Exactly. <laughs> 
excellent first pick to start us off. I'll be making my first pick of the Pantheon at the end of the next episode, but make sure you stay tuned for every episode this season. We'll reveal our Pantheon picks at the end of each. But maybe you'll remember that better in verse. Is there any of that poetry mead left? Yes. Here you go. Thank you. Ten gods chosen five apiece from the world around. In sky or sea or deep dark pit, could they all be found? We'll share the tales of people whose lives our choices touched and set aside the differences that once they may have clutched. So stick around this season, we promise you won't yawn once you see who we draft in our fantasy pantheon. Hey foodies, you're missing out if you're not watching the new stuff cooking over on PBS Food. Go on a tasty journey to find the best South Asian food in America on Spice Road, or get ready to swap delicious recipes from different cultures on Pan Pals. The channel has shows covering the history of iconic dishes to food science. Hit the link in our description to check them out. Just don't watch these on an empty stomach. I would wear this outfit though. I low-key would actually probably wear this. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Why not to the Vizier and the Anir? That's not what they're called. Uh oh.